And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to webinar number four with our Somnimed SOM series, Sleep Partners. Uh, my name is Lewis Myers. I'm the director of sales for Somnimed. I want to welcome Dr. Ken Mogel to the uh, to the webinar tonight. Uh, we are going to do the best we can in light of the fact that Dr. Chediak is unable to make it. And we're very bummed about this, but he had an abscess and a failed root canal, which required an extraction today. So he is not feeling well at all. It was kind of like an emergency situation and uh, nothing, obviously nothing he could do about it. So we are missing him. Um, and uh, Dr. Mogel just hung up the phone with him and kind of got the news. So yeah, it's a big, big, big bummer. But nonetheless, uh, Dr. Mogel has an incredible story to tell um, about not only his practice, but his relationship with Dr. Chediak, which goes back quite a ways. Hi, Dr. Mogel. How are we doing? We're good. Yeah, we're good? We're good. Right. We're good. Yeah, excellent. So as you know, if you've been dialing into these webinars the past couple of weeks, we, we really wanted to kind of make a little noise and um, profile dental sleep medicine partnerships partnerships out there that are working exceptionally well uh, initially that started out as the as the dds and md partnership and those referral pathways that are oh so important and relationships out there that 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 work just terrific um, we took it a little step further and and we looked at other relationships that are so critical in the in the sleep practice a couple of our webinar uh, stars that have been on. Uh, uh, Kent Smith was on last week along with his full-time sales and marketing rep, Mike Ring, and uh, Brandon Hedgecock will be with us next Friday with Sarah Morris, who is a full-time employee at Sleep Better Austin and helps Dr. Hedgecock market his practice throughout the greater Austin area. So that being said, Dr. Mogel, let's... Um, in the absence of Dr. Chediak, let's want to tell us a little bit about him. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with him. How did it happen? What makes it so successful? Um, <clears throat> I've been working with Dr. Chediak now for about uh, eight or nine years. And um, he happens to be in uh, the Boca Raton area, the, the godfather of sleep. Um, he's the only person in the area who has a only sleep only practice um, <clears throat> unlike so many other sleep physicians he's a neurologist not a pulmonologist or not an emt and um, he's very particular he's uh very good at what he does um, and i was fortunate that i was able to um, get in to see him and he started me sending me you know patients the relationship built quite a bit from there and then where the relationship really took off where I really started to be able to see a lot more of his patients is when um, I started getting involved as enrolled in Medicare and uh, matter of fact Dr. Chediak's practice to date now he doesn't see anything but Medicare patients no private insurance he doesn't even take a cash paying patient he has his own lab he's has his own four bed lab and as I was explaining to you, Lewis, he's uh, very unique in that he does everything himself. He doesn't have a nurse. He doesn't have an MA. He doesn't have a PA. He does everything soup to nuts himself. Mm -hmm. So he's very comprehensive, very much in control, uh, very good at what he does. And um, you know, when I it, Medicare was really where the, the relationship took off that provided me the opportunity to work with him quite a bit. Um, He's good that he keeps me on my toes and he calls me out a couple of times when he thinks it's appropriate. And I respect that it's usually done with a uh, constructive form of criticism, but he's, he's, he's become a very good peer and uh, I enjoy spending time with him a lot. Where was he when you first met him as far as his belief in oral appliance therapy? And I imagine it's, it's increased with time as you, as you've, uh, you know, treated his patients. Where did his viewpoint on oral appliance therapy start versus where it is today? Um, I, it, it was, he was sending out to a few people in the community, but not very much. 
Um, I think that we were fortunate enough to see enough of his patients be successful with treatment that we changed his perception of oral appliance therapy. And um, in the Boca area, he's my nor he's my main re referrer, but also I, I, you know, he basically, uh, you know, he only refers to me for the most part. I've gotten his confidence in it. He does send to a few other people, but primarily it's just me. Um, yeah. And it's the relationship has grown with the degree of success. Um, I think he's just become more confident in that in that manner. Obviously, also as appliances have changed and evolved, uh, he, as you well know, he loves the Herps Advance. He mm. thinks it's the best appliance on the market. He doesn't want me to do any other appliances. He really loves being able to look at that visual indicator wow. because he's so hands-on. He he he. he he even what he likes to he likes to adjust the appliance on his own uh, although i'm not a big fan of that because he never tells me but he's very much proactive and taking control about those things but he loves the herbs advance he thinks it's a great device oh love to hear that um did you uh have you actually made him a device does he does he sleep with one does can he speak about it from personal experience he, he has a um i have yet to make him a device i've offered him several times um he uses a he does have a device he's got a tap which he hates um i get i guess what i have to do is i have to be proactive and just go over there with my scanner and just say okay we're doing this today. <laughs> but no, I haven't made him a device. No. Dr. Mogill, you have a unique practice. It's uh, mm. tell 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 us a little bit about how your personal practice is structured. It's a little different than than a, just a you know typical a, a typical dental practice. Help the audience understand kind of how you're set up. Um I, I don't practice dentistry at all anymore. I probably can say that I haven't picked up a handpiece in a little over two years. Um, I have four different offices that I work out of. Um, my main office is in Boca Raton. I rent space in three other uh, offices. I rent space in a physician's office in uh, Melbourne. I rent space in a physician's office in um, Vero Beach. And I rent space in a sleep lab in uh, Jupiter. Every Thursday and Friday, I go to my Thursday. Every Thursday, I'm in my Melbourne office, and every Friday, I'm in my Bureau office. Every other week, I'm in my Jupiter office. The rest of the time, I'm in Boca. And um, I'm I'm very fortunate. I've got great relationship with the physicians up at Melbourne and Bureau. They're tremendous. They uh, they really really buy into what we do. Um, they're very very proactive. Very very big in all points. It, it it might be obvious, um, but I'm assuming that the the places where you rent office space, that is an that's a medical practice where by, where the referrals come from, correct? Yeah, yeah. Their their physician their physician offices. Uh, the the physician I rent from in in Vero Beach, his name is John Suen. Excuse me. Is John Suen, and. Um, Dr. Suen also uh, has a a four bed sleep lab, and we literally uh, we literally work out of the bedrooms. Um, we set up there every day and tear it down every day. Uh, Melbourne, I work with uh, Dr. Patel. Excuse me, uh, it's Dr. It's Dr. Banzel, Harvish Banzel. He's a pulmonologist also. He's the medical director of a sleep lab, and he's got a pulmonary office there in Melbourne. And uh, I rent space from him, and, and he's my primary. Although we have expanded more in Vero to, uh, to Melbourne to other positions, and even so in Vero, because I've been in Vero now for almost eight years, we've developed a reputation that the other sleep docs in town refer to us, the ENTs refer to us. We, we've been fortunate to. Um, <clears throat> develop a good enough reputation that we have other physicians referring to us. But but Dr. Soon and Dr. Banzel are primary referrers in their office. Do most of these guys kind of follow the same set protocol as far as referring patients to you for oral appliance therapy, CPAP failures, whatever, or are they all over the map? 
how how does it vary office uh, position by position? Dr. Chediak's pretty adamant about the fact that he really wants his patients to use a CPAP. I've had many conversations with him, and he's talked about the fact that you know he'll try once, twice, three times, four times to get him to be compliant with the CPAP, and then he'll refer to me. He has um, gotten a little bit more flexible about that over the past couple of years. Dr. Suen, on the other hand, will refer anybody at any point. He is not real proactive on sending people who got an EHI of six or seven for a CPAP. It, you know, he knows that in so many of these cases, it's kind of ridiculous and absurd. And so he's, he's pretty good about that. And so is Dr. Banzel. But Chediak's a little bit more, um, he believes very strongly in the CPAP. And, and rightfully so. I respect his opinion. Yeah. Do you ever ask them to consider kind of mining the database for CPAP non-compliant patients and to, 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 to market or present an oral appliance therapy option? <clears throat> Does it ever go that route? Or they, would they consider doing that? That's a good question. You know, I do know that Dr. Suen just about, I, I have followed with Dr. Suen in his office and just about every patient that he, he treats who has been diagnosed, he does let them know there is another option besides a CPAP. He prefers, like many do, for the CPAP, but, but he lets them know they do have other options. As far as mining their database, no, I have, um, <clears throat> haven't done that. Great idea. Um, I don't know if they'd be willing to do that or not. That's a, um, I, I, I don't think that, unlike many of us, um, I don't think they really keep real close track of that stuff. Yeah. I don't, that's my perception there. Their follow-up is not like most dentists are because we're used to doing follow-up and hygiene follow-ups. And we pretty much make sure our patients come back on a regular basis, <clears throat> whether hygiene or sleep. I, I'm not really sure they have that much of a, um, that I'm not really convinced that they do that. Um, that they really sit back and say, oh, we haven't seen this patient in a year. Wow, we should reach out to them and let's get them back in and see how they're doing. And I, uh, and I think many of them rely on the DME company to um, make sure the patients are being compliant with the CPAPs, unfortunately. And as we all know, the DME companies are more concerned about getting it, you know, getting paid and having them keep the, the, the CPAP for 13 months so they get paid entirely. You were on a webinar three, four weeks back where we presented this new uh, program called the Effectiveness Equation. I bring it up because it sounds to me like there might be a very interesting opportunity to use the Effectiveness Equation to show, to put in front of some of your guys just to see if they buy off on the fact that, you know, Effectiveness is a function, right, of efficacy and compliance. And um, for those on the uh, that are listening in that don't know what I'm talking about, the, the effectiveness equation is a new is a is is a is a really cool, high quality professional tool um, that Somnimed developed that we're going to make available to our to our dental customers. Uh, and and what it does is it explains the the clinical proof behind oral appliance therapy relative to CPAP. Um, it uses data, existing data that's out there. It's just never been shown in this way, and it's quite unique. After seeing it, Dr. Mogel, if you can remember, I know it's been several weeks, but I mean, is it, you've been working with some of these guys a long time. Has the relationship gone so far and been intact in for so long that maybe taking something like clinical data and findings, and a, but a new way of showing it, it have you missed the boat with these guys, or is this something you think they would be interested in looking at? Um, you know, what I really liked about the, the, uh, the program was that you could put your own data into it. I you found can. that very exciting because yeah. if, if you know, we try to keep track of all of our patients from, <clears throat> because I see so many Medicare patients, many of my patients go back and get titration PSGs. Um, Medicare, you know, it's, it's easy. They don't have to pre-off, but they never get denied. So we are definitely calibrating in, um, in sleep studies. And so we have kept track over the years of what our pre-AHI, post-titration AHI was. And I found it interesting to be able to 
put that data in there to show the physicians our own data in that in that program. Uh, I, I don't think that the guys I work with currently, like the Suin, the Banzo, maybe the Banzo, the Chediac, it's going to make much of a difference. Where I find it interesting to be able to use that is when you're making new relationships. Yeah. It, 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 the biggest problem we have with the physicians is changing their paradigm. And I'm hoping that that program is going to allow us to break through to get them to change that paradigm to at least, at least offer patients the option and to see that it is a viable option where so many of them just don't believe it. Uh, we still know there's a bias towards CPAP and a bias against oral appliance therapy by a lot of physicians. And it could be a tool that could change it. But I did like the fact that bringing it to some of the newer physicians, um, I have a new physician coming into Vero Beach that I would love to show it to. And it'd be a great marketing tool in that part. I want to encourage um, all of our people that are listening in. You've got a, a question box um, that you can uh, type in, type in any questions that you may have. We'll, uh, we'll fire those off to Dr. Mogill here at the very end. I don't think we're going to go as long tonight just because we don't have a physician uh, contributing and typing in, uh, but we'll continue. Dr. Mogill, let me ask you this. Um, you spend a lot of time in the car. You're going to four different offices. Do you have time to get out there and 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 you know be the sales guy and and meet with these sleep physicians? No, I don't. I um I, I do occasionally, but I uh, like like Ken has. I do have I have two individuals who are marketers for me. Uh, I have um, a woman who markets the South Florida area, and then I have a lady who. Uh, who markets for me up in the, the Vero Beach, Melbourne, Fort Pierce area. So um, I rely pretty much heavily on them. Um, uh, we do occasionally get out there and, and go for dinners. I think that's a great, I, I don't like doing uh, lunch and learns. I haven't found them to be very successful only because from my perspective is that um, it's the middle of the day and um, you know, they're, they got a lot of other things going on. I'd rather meet one-on-one -on -one with the physician straight on. I usually invite the, um, Besides the physician, I usually invite their key person, whether it be their marketer or their uh, their nurse practitioner, and, and my marketer will come with us. And so we um, it, that's that's more of the marketing we do, um, and, and and they're responsible for building a lot of my relationships and maintaining the relationships. Nice. Are they full time employees of the of the, of the practice? <clears throat> yeah, they are. Um, Catherine is a full time marketer. Uh, Vicky. Vicki up in the Melbourne Bureau area works two days a week marketing and two days a week she works chair side with us. Very good. Okay. Um, I want to switch gears. Well, you've obviously read the uh, uh, the talking points for ADSM on the guidelines for uh, for prescribing oath in this COVID-19 world we're living in. Um, thoughts on that communication? I think it was well thought out. Um, I think it was very pertinent. I think the AS the AASM statement was 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 when all the COVID stuff really came out was was tremendous. Um, that the fact they basically came out and said during this time, you know, that oral appliances are more more, more are safer. Mm -hmm. I may be paraphrasing that, but I think that's basically what they said that they didn't encourage people to be using the CPAPs. Uh, because of the contamination positive, uh, uh, you know, issues. Um, but again, we go back to the same thing. How many of the physicians really read it? How many of the physicians really paid, paid attention to it? Hard thing to know. You know, uh, they're, they're a tough lot to break through on. So, um, but I thought the AASM did a great job. The AADSM did a great job on that, bringing that forth and uh, setting a good policy. Mm-hmm. So what does your practice look like in this day of COVID-19? I assume like most folks, you were, you were away from the office for a while. Yeah, we, we, were, we were gone for about four weeks. We did a lot of telemedicine during that time, mm -hmm. uh, which was good because it kept my sanity. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't get a chance to do telemedicine calls. It would have been bored out of my mind. Um, you know, we've done the, the preparation like everybody else done. You know, we put up the... Uh, the plexiglass shields at the front desk. You know, dentists in general compared to physicians' offices have always been very disinfectant oriented. So for us to do 
to go a couple more steps is pretty much in the norm. You know, everybody's wearing masks and shields and gloves, and we have disposable jackets. And um, although we don't really work with aerosol in, in sleep practice, but they, you know, I do have disposable jackets for my team if they want to. We even gone to the extent that we are fogging the office with hydrochloric acid uh, uh, in the morning and in the evening just to try and disinfect it a little bit more to keep not so much for the patients, but my staff to feel safe. Patients really don't know the difference, but they can see some of the things we're doing. But we're trying to just be as careful as possible. We encourage everybody to wear masks. We don't allow people to sit in the reception area. Everybody, we have everybody call before they cut, get, when they get to the office, we have them call us. We tell them to wait in their car. And that when we're ready for them, we ask them to come up to the office and we bring them right into the examination room. And that way there's nobody in the, um, the reception area and they don't have, uh, besides myself and the clinical assistant they're working with, they don't have any interaction or contact with anybody else. So we're protecting people that way too. Okay. And the medical practices uh, pretty much adhering to the exact same guidelines since since you're officing in these exact same places. Yeah, the, not quite. We, we do in our, in our, we're not able to obviously defog them, but we spray everything down real well, wipe everything down. We're still, again, we're wearing masks and shields and, and disposable gowns. Uh, but the physicians, again, they're, 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 they've gotten better. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm still seeing physicians' offices that they're not wearing masks all the time. It's really amazing. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're just not doing it. They're, 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 I don't know if they're not as concerned. Uh, but they certainly, they do disinfect the rooms more than they ever have before. Yeah. Yeah, crazy world we're living in. Um, really, really crazy. Do we have, I don't, I don't have any questions in my, in my, uh, in my pain. Actually, I have, I have something here. Yeah, no, I, no, I don't. So I'll, I will put out one more call if anybody has any, uh, um, any other questions. So, you know, uh, I had on my calendar pop up, Dr. Mogel, that uh, I think we were supposed to be checking into our hotels at AADSM either today or tomorrow. So bummed. Such a bummer. God, such a big bummer. Yeah, it, uh, those things have, ch have going to be changed for a long time, too. Yeah, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the <laughs> AASM. Wow, I got a crazy sun thing going on it's, there the sun it's making, um, it's making your head glow <laughs> the asm is having is is they were they're having their meeting this year but completely virtual virtual trade show floor the whole bit so and they do the uh, trade show virtually too i believe so i believe that you can enter an exhibit virtually and 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 have a discussion with 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 somebody from that company or whatever um at least that's i think that's my understanding of the way they're going to do it I saw um, that they're doing lectures virtually though. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they are. Um, good, good, good. We got a couple of questions coming in. I actually they're coming in rapid fire now. Um hello, Dr. Mark Levy. How are you, my man? Dr. Levy asks, Dr. Mogel, how would you advise someone new to dental sleep get started with a sleep doc? Um well, you know, obviously, there's never it never hurts to be personal and call them one on one, um, and reach out with them, see if you can meet with them. Um, you know, they got to have a reason. You got to give them a reason to want to meet with you too. You know, um, obviously, in my case, I I generally have my, uh, my 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 individuals who market for me. They typically set the table. They not they cold call on people. They knock on doors. They get through the front door. They meet people. And they set up meetings for me. Um, uh, but you know, getting through the front door is always the most challenging thing. Uh, you know, and if you're new to sleep medicine, you know, uh, why should they talk with you? If they already have referral sources, um, it, it, you're challenged. You're very challenged. Breaking that, uh, breaking their habit of referring to somebody else as opposed to you is if they're comfortable, it's gonna be difficult. But I would always think that that just trying to get in to meet them and have a one-on-one -on -one with them would always be the best way and, and, and impress them. 
you know, have confidence, let them know who you are, that you can take care of their patients, that you're going to make their patients well, that you're going to service their patients and give them 150% of your effort in order to manage their apnea adequately. Yeah, I love the idea of putting them into treatment always with a with a super comfy oral device if they're if they're a, a little bit resistant to listen. Um, Dr. Ken, what type of marketing do you like to do? Um, we basically, you know, typically, obviously, we have websites and we do SEO and. But my primary marketing is is Catherine and Vicky, uh, not, yeah, my people knocking on doors. Um, I, I wouldn't, I can honestly and 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 proudly say I wouldn't be where I was today if it wasn't for Catherine. Catherine uh, used to be my hygienist. She's worked with me for 18 years, and she has a passion for sleep medicine that is unabounding. And she is so confident that when she goes in and calls on people that she's convinced that just about everybody she's going to call on is going to be referring us patients. And she, she does a lot. She's gotten us into a lot of docs offices that are now consistent referrers. Do you have a success story that you can share? Was there, was there an office that was just completely off limits, impossible? The guy there is a schmuck whatever, uh, do, do you have a good success story you can share that you just never in a million, you had given up, but you uh, you allowed your staff to keep on pounding on that door and it ended up paying dividends. Any good stories? You know, I, I'm trying to, um, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. I, what, the story I do like to talk about with Catherine is that when we decided to, we wanted to grow our practice, um, she was the one who banged on all the doors up in the north part of the county, going up to Jupiter, going up to Bureau, going up to Melbourne. And she was the one who got me in the doors with those people. Um, and the, one of the day, and then Dr. Suen was challenging in the sense that I, I was glad I got to meet with him because his period, his basically said, I hate, I don't like referring to dentists. He says, I send the patients and they fall into a black hole and I never hear from them again. And so that's become kind of a mantra of our practice that we make sure that our patients don't fall into black holes, that we send the patients back. I think there's nothing more important that you can do to, to make sure that the, the patients get back to the referring physician. Uh, you know, they want to see them again. They're their patients to begin with. And it's, it's a paramount importance to us that we get them back where they came from and, and, and along the pathway of treating them, keeping in touch with them, communicating to them. Where they are in the progress. Yeah, uh, I I can't think of any any there <laughs> there are a lot of schmucks out there. I'm trying to think of one in particular. <laughs> um, I I can't think of anybody off the top that I would want to actually relate to. I'm sure there have been one or two. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Hello, Dr. Daniela Sever. Um, <laughs> Daniela, have, have you have you used the AADSM paper on oat to promote the treatment to your physicians? Yes. Not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, when I go to when I go to see them, I sell them on me. Yeah. I sell them on our experience. So what we we do have some other marketing tools. We 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 made up a little booklet that we give to the physicians that show a um, <clears throat> series of. Uh, pre and post uh, testing, pre-PSG, pre post-titration PSG, our protocols. Um, uh, there's a couple articles. There's a Sistoli article in there about you know, the effectiveness of oral appliances. Um, we show them graphs of our success uh, where I've done over the years where I've collected this data. And um, basically, that I go in there and show them that you know, what our experience is. I'm able to do that at this point because we've been doing it long enough. I, I couldn't necessarily say I could have done that, you know, nine years ago, but uh, now I can go in there because we've been doing this long enough. We have enough success. We're very confident in what we do and how we do it, when we do it, that we know that for the most part, the vast majority of our patients are going to be <clears throat> to some degree successful in, in managing their apnea. But I, I don't ever use, I, I can't recall ever going in using that, uh, that is part of my armamentarium at all. Gotcha. Okay. Um, 
agree with you that AADSM, AADSM did a great job on the paper. Again, from Dr. Sever, awesome. Um, that's all we got. That's all we got. And we went 31 minutes. That's longer than I thought we would go <laughs> without uh, Me too. Without I'm a, sorry, Dr. Chetty, I couldn't make it. I was, I really wanted to introduce everybody to him. He's uh, quite a, he's quite the pistol and a very charming individual. And I feel confident and comfortable that he wouldn't have been such tonight. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we can always do this again. I would, I would love to to put him on sometime and uh, it's always it's always awesome to hear both perspectives, the dentist and the physician perspective. And you know, one of the questions I would ask him was, "What does Dr. Mogel do so well that you uh, that you have such a great relationship with him?" It's always awesome to hear their viewpoint. Uh, and I, I know the audience loves hearing what the physicians value from you guys as well. You know, I had a conference with him not long ago. And one of the things he told me he likes about working with us is that. We let him know what's going on. We constantly are sending him letters, notes, telling him where his patients are at. <clears throat> and he loves the fact that I sent him back to him. Again, yeah. he's got strictly a Medicare pay practice, so everybody's going to get a titration PSG for the most part. He hate, he doesn't like HSATs. So everybody's going to basically get a, a titration PSG. And uh, we know for a fact that, I mean, now we know objectively that the appliance is titrated to a, a point of maximum efficacy. So yeah. he, he, lo he, he loves the communication that we give him. I know he's told me that many times. Nice, nice. And he likes the bottles of wine I bring him occasionally. Oh, of course. <laughs> Can't go wrong with the bottles of wine. All right, we will sign off, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Mogel. Thank you during thank what you is I know your I know your dinner hour. Um, everybody who's listening in, we are we will have Dr. Brandon Hedgecock and his full time sales and marketing field based sales rep, uh, Sarah Morris, on uh, Friday afternoon. Please be watching our social media channels, both LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, for information pertaining to upcoming webinars. Um, this is Lewis Myers. I'm signing out from a sunny and beautiful Dallas, Texas. You guys have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lewis. You're so welcome.